Go. Hey, you seen the pricing on this stuff lately? You seen the date lately? Huh. Yeah, it's been a while. How you doing? I did post a couple updates since the last episode, but seeing as they're easy to miss, the short version is we've had problems. A few months ago, Dad's blood pressure went crazy, and he had likely two lacunar strokes, which you don't exactly plan for. Now he's doing really well, and we've since been told that they didn't leave any permanent damage, so there's a lot to be grateful for. But nonetheless, it threw us for a loop and has forced a change of lifestyle. In addition to that though, over Christmas the whole family joined in the fun of the Rona after having very carefully avoided it thus far. So it's been fun. Thankfully we're a lot better now though and Dad's vitals are where they need to be, we just have to check his oil frequently. But as Subaru owners, nothing new there. Take this as a wake-up call for your own health then, and thanks to everyone who's reached out, it's really nice to know you haven't forgot about us. On the topic of Subarus, during all this, I acquired a new side project that's needed some love and a fresh outlook on life. So while Dad was recuperating, I made some headway there, and you should expect to see it in due course. Meanwhile, the GT6 has been neglected, so let's put an end to that. The whole point of this project is to have fun building something together in a single car garage. However, what that escalated into is far beyond what we ever expected as repair of the vintage sheet metal took ages, and designing a whole new drivetrain has taken ages more. But we are starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel, and the fun times continue today. Previously, we finished off our stainless exhaust system, and after getting your feedback, sorry I never responded, we are most definitely going to add some flexible sections here if I can find a specific product I like. Also mentioned though is that our fancy hangers may transmit a lot of noise into the cabin, and you're probably right again, of course. But still, I think at this point, we're just gonna see how bad it is first, as flex joints should actually help to a degree. So let's bear it in mind and move on to the next task, which is... <clears throat> oh yeah. Choices on the table. I guess the fuel tank should logically come next, as it's a large component in an area that we've been working in recently. Plus, we've even built a mock-up. Here's the thing though. And I could be totally wrong on this, but, uh, fuel tank? I'm guessing it could probably be good to get some more practice with the TIG first. So instead, let's move forward to the interior to take a look at the seating and driver controls. Or we could go under the hood. I've decided. The biggest problems here have already been crossed off the list, thank goodness, so everything else should be small potatoes. Things like the radiator, hood hinges, crash bar, and plumbing and shock absorbers, air intake, steering column, shaft, and general wiring. And a host of other small stuff that'll come in time. But I think we should start by nailing down the accessories first, as that will show us where some of those other parts will need to fit. <sighs> Honestly. So, what accessory drive components do we really need? Well, and a water pump and a ah, alternator will be somewhat helpful for the engine to kind of work. So they're given. But something that our non-Canadian or at least non-Ontarian friends may find surprising is that while yes, this time of year is spent on snowmobiles wrangling polar bears, June through September is generally muggy. And it's not uncommon to see Humidex values surpass 40 degrees. You can imagine then, this complicates what's long been said of the GT6, it's a hot little car. In fact, it's so hot it's a bit like having a cast iron oven in the cabin with you. Mostly because there was only a plastic tunnel separating you from the engine originally, so you really did have a cast iron oven in the cabin with you. That won't be the case for us, but still, it'd be great to cram some AC in here, so add it to the list. That's it? A water pump, alternator, and AC compressor? Dude, it's an LS. Just bolt them up, it's not that complicated. You may think at this point, it's an LS. It's not complicated. The factory setup's probably as good a starting point as any, and why is that guy always wearing the same thing? But remember, we're weirdos, and chose an LS4. 
at its factory drive hangs all the components out the side. Because in the front-wheel drive car it came from, it used to sit like so. But with it now longitudinal, it's no bueno. And that's why we got rid of it two years ago. Yet another reason why people don't generally bother with this engine. But it is still part of the LS family, and that means we've got, likely, more factory options than just about anything else out there. It's a pity, then, that they all put things either up here or down here. We knew ahead of time there's literally no room here. But this isn't so bad if we could just move things down a bit. Issue there is, they actually sit alongside the engine. So moving them down also moves them out into our wheel wells that are connected to the hood, which tips forward. Right. Well, maybe we should abandon this whole track and just use an electric water pump and run the alternator and compressor off the diff. That would get things out of the way, but it's not exactly ideal for a streetcar. Honestly, the only way I'm going to be happy is if we can somehow move everything completely in front of the engine and keep it in tight. Thankfully, though, we don't need to worry about how to do that. It turns out there's this fancy thing called the aftermarket, and it appears there are multiple vendors that provide beautiful bolt-on kits that do exactly what we need. It's just... we're not... completely... going to use any of them. This is the Holly LS mid-mount water pump manifold. And it might seem to contradict the last thing I just said. But here's the thing. I spent entirely way too much time researching and planning how we were going to buy components and build brackets to do what we need when this already does it. Look, a water pump that's a cartridge style, so replacement takes, like, less time than that. Five minutes. Integrated mounting bosses for the alternator and AC. It's perfect! Almost. This gorgeous kit, which does everything we could possibly want while fitting in our space, costs a little more than triple what we paid for our engine. Triple. That's over twice as much, people. And seeing as the competing options were priced equally and up, it ruled out the whole idea for me. That is, it did, until I discovered that Holly sells all their components individually. It wouldn't be interesting if we could put together roughly the same awesome kit with a few choice differences and save some cash. Everything revolves around the manifold, as I just mentioned, so it and the pump were necessary to start things off. But for air conditioning, the SD7 compressor required can be found all over the internet from... Yeah. Accompanied by horror stories of manufacturing shrapnel being sent through the entire AC system. So, the one you really want is a Sandin. This one, which is the same part that Holly includes in the kit. I just so happened to find this for a good deal from ITC Billet. No real price savings thus far then. But for the alternator, I quickly discovered that there are way more options in the GM world than you'd ever think necessary. And the DR44, DR44G, and AD244 all will not work because their wiring lug sticks out the back of the casing and will interfere with the front of our cylinder head. Holly's solution, of course, fits perfectly and looks awesome, but they do list right on their website that it's an LT1 style part, meaning for less than a fifth of the price, we could get this from a 2019 Chevy Silverado. Dimensionally, it's extremely similar, with the main difference coming down to the height here but that's easy to accommodate with the correct belt, and it will still end up being lower in height than the compressor, so hood clearance isn't ultimately affected. The catch, though, because of course there's a catch, is this is not a one-wire alternator. Meaning, you can't just hook up a single wire from here to the battery to tell it to charge. What's missed in that statement, though, is this does provide 13.7 volts of charge with absolutely no communication wire whatsoever. And that should be plenty to guess up and running. But even if it's not, the addition of a cheap pulse width modulation controller can unlock up to 15.5 volts of charge at 150 amps. If we need it, somehow. So, sweet. That'll do, and although this one's obviously used, it's still a pretty new factory part, and we'll just clean it up later. Great. Okay then, that's all the major components sorted out. 
So before we put them on the engine, let's quickly whip up some temporary shims to act as gaskets so we don't forget to account for them in the next steps. Another one for the water pump is also added before it can get snugged down tight, and a few bolts are then fed through the manifold and shims while we offer it up to the engine. If you've got a pretty keen eye, you might just have noticed that the hardware in use has a black oxide finish that will rust when exposed to the elements later. Reason for that being, we got all of it from a local supplier for way less than the official kit, and this was the only finish they had. So I guess we'll just add it to the list to sort out later. Anyway, with it on now, the boss here is for the belt tensioner. And thankfully, like with the alternator, this was another score. So I found that Holly's replacement part number was from a Jeep Wrangler of all things, and this one was 40 bucks shipped to Canada. A single bolt holds it in place, and we can move on to the compressor. Its first bolt is installed prior to the unit being slid into the mount, after which the second bolt is also inserted and they're both tightened down with an Allen key. The alternator is even easier if you can imagine, with two bolts simply installed from the front, and with that, there's the completed trio. Sweet! For something that's not exactly emotion-inducing, I gotta say, this is very nice. It's symmetrical, which I love, and although it's been a bit of a task to figure out the details in purchasing, at least the assembly was easy. Just get the feeling we're missing something, though. Ah, yes, a crank pulley could be helpful. Or harmonic balancer. Potato, tomato, tomato, potato. Now, GM doesn't make one that's the right depth, but Holly does offer two options. This cast unit, which looks entirely OE, or an SFI certified one, which just means it's approved for racing applications, basically. Let's be honest, this is the one you want. I mean, it's gorgeous, but uh, there's no easy way to say this. It's twice the price and requires a pulley to be purchased as well. If you're willing to relinquish that certification, though, as anyone who drives a normal car does every day without even thinking about it, turns out you can buy a very similar balancer to the ATI one Holly includes for, get this, less than a quarter of the price. And as it turns out, it's a very well-made piece by Australian company PCE, even though USA Performance is laser etched into the face of it. I don't understand either. This is their 10% underdrive model, though, and that doesn't really matter to us, as we won't actually be using either of these ribbed areas for driving our belt. As that will be taken care of by this, the Holly Pulley. To be like 100% honest, this was a total gamble on my part. Both the ATI and PCE units share this bore diameter. They have to, they're for LS engines. So going by the photos alone, if the bores here are the same, the surrounding bolt patterns sure do look extremely similar. There's really no reason for this to work, but I just have a feeling. <laughs> and you doubted my ability at random chance. Well, the race fits at least. Just give me a sec. Yes! Thank you! Now I can tell you that my contingency plan was to drill three new holes in the pulley if the bolts didn't line up, or potentially turn down the OD here, or the ID here, or make a centering ring. But we don't have to do any of that. Literally, it's a bolt-on solution. And yes, that is a novel concept for this project. If you want to get all pessimistic, I suppose the only remaining issue could be the offset relative to the other accessories, but again, I'm just getting the feeling it's going to work. To find out though, the hub receives some oil, since it's a tapered fit, and I picked up a fancy installation tool. I foresee a problem. <laughs> can't, can't get our knee pecs in I there. need a socket on that. Mm -hmm. So we may not be able to do this tonight, sir. No. Interesting. Huh. <laughs> All right. I was so excited to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Surprise. apparently I have to buy another tool, so I already spent 40 bucks on tools just to install the wretched thing, and now I have to spend another whatever on a socket. And it's going to have to be a pretty stinking deep socket, too, because you got to be able to... Get over that. Okay, I'm going to stop. How do people normally do this? <laughs> <laughs> so the problem here, which I didn't foresee, 
is that that sits all the way down in there, and there is no way to get some pliers on it. It's just too far in. And even if we had a deep socket that came out, you could maybe get a ratchet on it, but then you got no way of getting a plier, pair of pliers on here to hold this steady. So you really do have to use a wrench or something, something open-ended. So we kind of thought, well, we're a little snookered here, but never say never. This is a couple of little pieces of tubing we had laying around and some duct tape because we're fans of red green. What this does here is fit very snugly inside of there. So all we've done is now extend that out. Now that sits out to there and now we can get on it. So try. let's go back over to the engine and try, try it again. again. <laughs> Some people like to heat up the balancer in an oven to allow it to expand and slide right in place. And there's really nothing wrong with that, but I'm never opposed to buying new tools, and this just does sit better with me. Oh, and if you're wondering why the crankshaft rotates so easily, bear in mind the whole engine was torn down back in episode 10, so the only thing inside it is the crankshaft. And speaking of which, another little anomaly of the LS4 is the crank is actually 13 millimeters shorter than a normal one. 3 millimeters on the flywheel side and 10 millimeters on the snout here. Thankfully, that doesn't create any issues for us as the taper's the same, it's just cut short. So once we've sourced a slightly longer bolt, we won't even need to give things a second thought, though I guess we shouldn't expect it to run a blower someday. Not that power is something we're going to be wanting for, I have a feeling. So the old bolt will do for test fitting, and the new holly pulley can get held in place with some more temporary hardware. Good. Very good. The alignment is spot on, at least according to a straight edge and my one good eye, so there's nothing left to do but measure for a belt. The tensioner needs to be held back while a string finds the length, and we'll simply jot down the number for now as there's literally no point in getting a belt till we're ready to hit the streets. If you've been wondering all this time what that extra bit's for, it's intended to mount a power steering pump, which we can't use as our absolutely adorable rack has no provision for hydraulic assist. Yet, we've added wider tires, a faster steering ratio, and more caster angles, so there is a possibility we'll still want some help later. I suppose we'll just figure it out in time. For now though, that's it. Mucho finito. Plus, we've even got clearance to the hood. About as much if not more than the factory engine if the memory serves. Talk about winning. Some of you at this point are probably happy, yet still slightly confused. I mean, the video is almost over and we haven't even picked up one of these yet. But here's the deal. With one thing and another, this episode has been in the works for over half a year. It took a solid month to assemble on paper the perfect solution to our needs, and it took another month just to get the parts in and actually witness everything working together. Meanwhile, all that effort could have been completely avoided if we just bought the kit or were sponsored. <clears throat> So the real question is, did we save enough to justify the hassle? To a few of you, probably not. But even though we've ended up with the same water pump, manifold, compressor, and crank pulley, the remaining three quality parts managed to save us 50% of what the kit runs, and that does go a long way towards parts for the future. Some of which will definitely be from Holly, and others, well, they'll be revealed next time. Thanks for watching. If you feel we've earned it, subscribe and hit the bell so YouTube will know we're doing cool stuff. Huge thanks, as always, to our patrons and supporters who help ease the burden of the algorithm. And if you'd like to help out as well, there are links below, plus a very convenient share button. Stay healthy, stay warm, and we'll catch you next time.